I don't want to dwell much because I know and many a times I get tempted to go back to the background and end up being stuck, you know, and on the previous message. So can we today go straight to the book of Ezra, chapter 3, and we read from verse 1. The Bible, it reads, And when the seventh month had come, and the children of Israel were in the cities, the people gathered together as one man to Jerusalem. Then Joshua, the son of Josedach, and his brethren, the priests, and Zerubbabel, the son of Shiltiel, and his brethren, arose and built the altar of the God of Israel to offer burnt offerings on it, as it is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. Verse 3. Though fear had come upon them, though fear had come upon Zerubbabel, the son of Shiltiel, and Josedach, jo and his brethren, the priests, though fear had come upon them, the kingdom builders, those who had arrived from Persia to rebuild the temple of their God, because of the people of those countries, they set the altar on its bases and they offered burnt offerings on it to the Lord. Both the morning and evening burnt offerings. They also kept the feast of the tabernacles as it is written and offered the daily offerings in the number required by ordinance for each day. Hallelujah. Father, in the name of Jesus, this is your word. Lord, I pray that, Lord, you nourish us through the power of your word. Lord, I pray, O oh God, that you will edify us, O oh Father, through the power of thy word. Because I'm let the incorruptible seed transform, renovate our minds. Let it align our will with your will. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen and amen. Can you say amen with me on that timeline? You know, and as we are about to feast, as we are about to go through the word of life, the word that endureth forever. When Paul the Apostle, before he sailed to Jerusalem in Acts chapter 20, he speaks to the elders at Miletus and he says, I commend you, hallelujah, to God and to the word of his grace that is able to build you up and give you an inheritance amongst the sanctified. And this word, it is the ability to build us up. It has the power to activate spiritual growth in our spiritual lives. And let's go straight to the word of the Lord. In chapter 1 last week, I spoke about their arrival. As they arrived, they had silver and gold and bronze. As they arrived, they had material wealth. And as well as the livestock that they were given by King Cyrus, the king of Persia. We did touch in the book of Isaiah, chapter 44 and chapter 45, when Isaiah spoke prophetically about their release, about their deliverance from the hand of the Babylonians and as well as the Persians, that Cyrus will tell my people and say, let the temple of the Lord be built. Let the foundations of his temple be laid, be established. And indeed, we saw the fulfillment of the prophetic word that the Lord released in Ezra chapter 1. The Bible tells us in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 1, verse 12, I am ready to perform my word. My word I shall 
fulfill. Why I shall fulfill my word. I am not the son of men that I should lie. Our God in the book of Malachi chapter 3 verse 6. The Bible tells us I am the Lord God and I do not change. And we saw the fulfillment of that prophetic word. The Lord fulfilling. The Lord executing his prophetic word. The children of Judah and Benjamin. They arrived in Jerusalem. Hallelujah. With, as I've said to you. With material wealth. With kingdom wealth. For kingdom mandate. Hallelujah. Where there's God's purpose. There is provision. Provision will always navigate its way. To find God's purpose. To ensure that those who embody God's purpose. They are financially empowered. Not just financially empowered. To execute the kingdom mandate. But that provision. Vision, it comes as a package. Hallelujah. Strength is there. Resilience is there. Mental, I mean, a, 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 a fortitude is there. I mean, a winning mentality is there. It comes as a package. Protection is, is, is there because God's hand signifies God's favor. Hallelujah. And now, I want us to understand that in chapter 2, the Bible puts it clear. It tells us something. It says now it gives us the senses. It gives us the names and the families that actually came back from Persia to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. Now, if we go to chapter 3, the Bible that it tells us here, that it was the seventh month, and during the seventh month they celebrate the Feast of the Tabernacles, or if you may, of booths, you know, where they stay in temporary shelters, and as to commemorate, you know, the, the journey of their forefathers in the wilderness, and I don't want to dwell much in there. But today, I want us to zoom in to verse 2. The Bible says then Joshua, I'm reading again for the second time, the son of Josedek and his brethren, the priests, and Zerubbabel, the son of Shiltiel, and his brethren, arose and built the altar of the God of Israel to offer burnt offerings on it, as it is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. So now we see the priests here and uh, Zerubbabel, the son of Shiltiel, and their governor. The Bible says they rose up. The first thing that they did, remember in chapter 1, they also received not just the free will offering, but besides the free will offering, they received the vessels of gold that Nebuchadnezzar had captured and taken from the temple of the Lord that was built by Solomon. That temple, it was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar and his soldiers. Now Cyrus, what did he do? He made the point that those vessels of gold, the vessels of the Lord, they were taken from the temple of the gods of the Babylonians and were restored back into the hands of the children of God. And when they arrived, they arrived with those vessels with silver and with gold and as well as the live stock. Why live life stock? So that when they arrive, it was a clear, this, this material wealth, it's not for your will. It's for the house of the Lord. This material wealth that I'm giving you, that's what Cyrus said. Even the king that released the Ezra in chapter 7 made clear it is not, I mean, for your will, but for the will of your God, for kingdom mandate, for his covenant to be established. Now, it is clear that they were given that livestock so that they can arrive and burn sacrifices and offer burnt offerings unto the Lord God Almighty. Now, the first thing that they did, the Bible, it tells us something here that is important. It says they rose up to rebuild. Really 
build the altar. Child of the living God, I want you to understand something here that is important. When they arrived in Jerusalem, before they rebuilt the temple, before they set their hands in laying the foundations of the temple again, the Bible tells us they rebuilt, they built up the altar of the Lord. The Bible, it tells us something here, that the first thing that they repaired, it was the brazen altar, the altar of burnt offerings. Then I will explain to you what the altar signifies, why it was so important for the children of Judah to rebuild the, the, the altar of the Lord before building the temple, before placing their hands in rebuilding and laying the foundations of the temple. The first thing that they did, it was to ensure that the altar, hallelujah, it is rebuilt. Remember Nebuchadnezzar, what did he do? He destroyed the temple that Solomon built and what, not only the temple, even the altar itself, it was destroyed. It was torn apart. And the Bible tells us that Josedak and his brethren, the priests, they rebuilt it not according to the, 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 their own measurement. They rebuilt it not according to their own formula and pattern. They rebuilt it according to the pattern that was given to Moses. Hallelujah. This, we are talking here about another generation that came after thousands of, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, hundreds of years after Moses. Hallelujah. But this generation could still be faithful to the pattern that was given to the man of God, Moses, as, they, as the author alludes in chapter 3. But before we speak about the altar, before we speak about them rebuilding the, the altar, let's go straight to verse 3. The Bible declares, though fear had come upon them because of the people of those countries, they set the altar on its basis. Now, I want you to understand something here. They were afraid. They were afraid of the countries that were nearby, that surrounded Jerusalem. They were terrified. That's what the Bible declares here. The remnant that arrived in Jerusalem, they were afraid. They were under terror. Why? They were afraid of the countries, the nations that were nearby, that surrounded them. What? And, and, and the Bible declares they were at the end and as they were afraid, fear had come upon them, as I've said, because of the nations that were I mean, nearby. They set the altar on its basis. I want you to understand something, child of the living God. In verse 2, we hear the Bible telling us that they rose up. They said, let us first restore. Let us first repair. Let us first rebuild the altar that is broken down. But in the midst of that, they acknowledged, we are afraid, because the author is saying, they were afraid, fear had come upon them. It had come, maybe let me put it this way, and say, as the Bible declares, fear had come upon them because of the people of those countries. But in the midst of that fear that it had come upon them, they did not allow that fear to penetrate their heart. They did not allow that fear to invade their, um, their, their winning uh, and their mentality. They did not allow that fear to invade their fortitude, which is a mental attitude. Fortitude means, yes, Yes, I am courageous in the face of danger. Courage means I am afraid. Yes, I do acknowledge that there is a fear. I am afraid, but I am moving forward. I am afraid. I am not going to stop walking. I am not going to stop running. I am not going to stop building with with an unquenchable passion, this altar unto the Lord, our God, 
hallelujah, they refused to be in the spider's web of fear, of, of man. They refused that their thinking will be shaped, that their actions will be shaped, that their decisions will be shaped by the fear of man. Because the Bible tells us that the fear of man is a snare. These believers in the midst of destructive storms and the shadow, hallelujah, of fear, of imminent danger that at any moment and time these countries, they can arrive and attack us. But they said, you know what? We are going to rebuild, hallelujah. We are going to build and set this altar unto the Lord. We are not going to allow fear to disarm and substitute our faith. These men, the Bible declares fear had come upon them, but they continued to build the altar anyways. They continued to execute the will of the Father. Hallelujah. If no fear had come upon them, fear comes to substitute our faith. Faith and fear, they don't coexist. We can see the resilience and the strength of their faith. That even though fear had come upon them, but they did not allow fear fear to have its way. They did not allow fear to paralyze their God-given abilities. They did not allow fear to neutralize and disarm their mobility. Hallelujah. To execute the will of the Father. Hallelujah. Whenever you are about to build something, the enemy will roar. The, 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 will roar. The voice, the, 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 the voice of the enemy rather will roar fear and intimidation and limitation and impossibility and failure in your life. But we must emulate these believers. We must emulate these courageous, persistent men who were able to build in the midst of that fear. Fear, even though fear had come upon them, but through the power of faith, they established the altar of the Lord. When David speaks, he says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil. Why I shall fear? No evil, for the Lord God Almighty is with me. Hallelujah. I shall fear no evil, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow. The shadow is the reflection. The shadow, it speaks about the, re I mean, it, 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 it is the reflection of, 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 of a thing. So in other words, David is saying, I know I am walking in a terrain that in, at any moment, David is imminent. Hallelujah. Death is imminent. Ambush is imminent. But I am here to tell you, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil. So in other words, David is saying, I'm still walking even in the shadow. I am not going to sit and wait for the shadow to disappear. I am not going to stop walking and wait for the shadow to vanish in the midst of that shadow of of death I shall walk. So in other words, fear of the unknown, you are not going to stop my rhythm. You are not going to stop my consistency. You are not going to stop my momentum. I'm going to continue to walk with this vision. I'm going to continue to walk with this purpose. I am going to continue to walk. Hallelujah. And build this vision. And build this dream. And build this business. And build this family and build my community for the glory of the soon coming king. Why? Because even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil. For greater is he that is in me more than the shadow of a thing. Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah. Greater is he that is within me more than the devil that is in the world. The Bible tells us in the book of Timothy, Paul speaks, he says, Timothy, the Lord God has not given us the spirit of fear of timidity, but the Lord God Almighty has given us the spirit of love and soundness of mind and boldness. These I mean, builders, they rose up with boldness. They rose up with courage. They rose up with persistence in the midst of destructive storm, in the midst of rumors that the nations, they are making their way to Jerusalem. Even though fear had come upon them, you do acknowledge, I'm afraid, but I am not giving in. I am not giving up. I am directing this fear unto the Lord. It is not going to, it, it, it is not going to temper with my mobility. You see, when a lion roars, a lion roars in the forest for the prey to be confirmed Confused. The lion roars in the forest for the prey to be immobile instead of the prey taking flight. It gets spoken instead of the enemy taking flight. It gets afraid and it is neutralized. It can run. It can unleash its abilities of agility and swiftness. Why? Because of the roar of the lion and many times the pecker it gets scattered and some of the prey it runs straight to the canines of death of the lion and this is exactly what the enemy wanted to do to these builders the enemy sent messages and sent rumors and fear came upon them but they said you know what in the face of fear in the face of discouragement in the face of limitation and importance possibility in the face of danger we are moving forward that's what courage does child of the living god that's what fortitude does you should not wait for that fear to vanish you must retain you must protect you must guard your faith and understand we are in a word war word war word war fight a good fight of faith protect the purity of your faith timothy protect and insulate fight to protect thy faith from being disarmed by fear because fear substitutes faith because fear paralyzes us paralyzes us and paralyzes our God-given abilities these believers here they rose up these builders they rose up to build the first thing that they built it was the altar child of the living God God. They built the altar before the building. The first thing that they did, they made it a point that the altar is repaired. The altar is restored. Now let us look at, I mean, the altar itself. Why they first built the altar? Why? They, the first thing that they placed their hands to do, it was to restore the brazen altar. The Bible, it tells us in chapter 35 in the book of Exodus, you remember that the children of Israel, when they marched out of Egypt, the Lord caused his favor to be upon them. And they found favor in the eyes of the Egyptians. And when they asked whatever they asked for, they were given mirrors, bronze, silver, and gold. And they went out wealthy. They went out with material wealth. But in the book of Exodus chapter 5, we are told that the Lord called for a free will offering. And Moses, he conveyed the message. And he told God's people that the Lord wanted to build a sanctuary, a tabernacle. A tabernacle, it was the tent of testimony, and it represented the presence of our heavenly Father. Hallelujah! Because God wanted to dwell in their midst at the heart of their 
camp and that's where the tabernacle will be pitched whenever the cloud will stop and they would stop when the cloud moves they would move and the tabernacle it was built through the material wealth they received on their way out of Egypt and in one of as they were building the tabernacle it had different furnishes within it the Bible tells us that one of those furnishes it was the first asset the first furniture you came across when you would enter the outer court you would enter with one gate as you enter in that gate on the outer court the first thing that was there it was the brazen Altar, the altar of burnt offerings. And from the altar of burnt offerings, you have the laver basin which had water for the priest to ensure that from the brazen altar and the to the labor basin whatever dust you collected there that's where you wash and wash your hands wash your face why because the labor basin it was pointing us up to the word of the lord which is the mirror and to us the water hallelujah the word of god it's like water according to the book of Ephesians. Ephesians and the Bible in chapter 5 where the Bible declares he has washed us with the washing of water. I mean by what? By according or by his word. I don't want to dwell much in speaking about the, the, the furniture that was in the tabernacle in its entirety. I want to speak about the brazen altar today. Because in the holy place, that's where you found the seven golden, I mean, lamp stands. And that's where you found the unleavened bread. But before you enter the holy of holies, that's where the golden altar was. It was arrayed with gold. It was closer unto the Lord. That's where the incense, which speaks about the prayers of the saints, which speaks about the praise and the worship of the saints will be offered unto the Lord a sweet smelling aroma pointing to Jesus who is the sweet smelling aroma hallelujah but I don't want to speak about that today I promise you I will teach you one day about the significance of those of that furniture and we also we also have the ark of the covenant it was arrayed with pure gold it had two cherubs on top and within it there were two tablets that there was a rod of Aaron that budded, which shows that the Lord has chosen, I mean, Aaron has not chosen the other priests that were defying and questioning his authority. Now, let's go back to the brazen altar. The brazen altar, it was a place of sacrifice. The brazen altar, it was a place where Bulls, rams, goats will be slaughtered. Lambs without blemish will be slaughtered. And as you enter the tabernacle, the first meal you receive, it is the stench of death, the stench of the flesh that was burning on that altar. And the first time we hear about in the book of Leviticus chapter 9, Aaron himself, he offered a sacrifice there. And it was not consumed by the fire that was man-made. And that sacrifice, it was consumed by the consuming fire. The fire that came from God and consumed the sacrifice on that altar. I don't want to speak about how it was built. We know that there was bronze on that altar. There were four horns on the altar, which speaks about God's power. I don't want to speak about that today. But I want you to understand something. Why the altar? The altar, it was central. The altar, it was important to their faith. 
We don't only see the altar with God's people, even pagans, even people who practice witchcraft, people who bow down to their gods, Baal, they had their own altar. I will speak about that later. But the children of Israel, the first thing that they did, it was to rebuild their brazen altar. Hallelujah. They rebuilt this brazen altar. Why rebuilding the brazen altar? It was a place of sacrifice. An altar is a place of slaughter. An altar is a place of death. Not just death. An altar is a place of atonement. Where you atone. To atone. It is when the children of Israel, they have sinned against God and they take a bull without blemish, a bull that was a healthy, a bull, and they take that bull and and, 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 and the priest will put his hands on the bull, transferring the sins of the nation, whether it's on the goat or on the ram, and making making the making the point that the sins of the nation they are transferred upon the bull or the ram, then the bull will be then slaughtered where on the brazen altar as it is slaughtered, that's where it will be burnt, hallelujah, as a burnt offering unto the Lord God Almighty and the Lord God Almighty, what he will do, the bull, if it has been offered according to the requirements of the law, then the Lord will accept their sacrifice. He will then forgive his people and restore his people and heal his people. That's how they maintained their intimacy with their heavenly father. The brazen altar, it was a reminder. You don't you dare enter the holy place and the holy of holies with an impure heart. Don't you dare enter the holy of holies with an ulterior motive. Don't you dare enter the holy of holies. You can't even enter the holy of holies without first passing from the first the requirement, the brazen altar, reminding the children of Israel about their limitation, reminding the children of Israel that about their sin, reminding the children of Israel that without their God, they will be consumed. Without their God on their side, without their God, hallelujah, they couldn't do anything. Why? Because the brazen altar, it reminds Reminded them about the forgiveness of their sins. The brazen altar, it reminded them that before you proceed, you don't appear empty handed before the Lord God Almighty. That was the brazen altar that in Ezra chapter 3 they started to rebuild. They were rebuilding the brazen altar. Altar, a place of atonement. Why atonement? It is because that sacrifice, that animal that was sacrificed on the brazen altar, it will make them to be at one meant with God. Hallelujah. It will restore the broken fellowship, broken relationship with their God. Hallelujah. And that's why the children of Judah, the first thing that they did, the priests and the root bell, it was to restore, it was to repair the altar. Underline this child of God. The altar that was broken down, it was the reflection of their spiritual brokenness and hopelessness. The altar that was broken down, burned into ashes, it was the reflection of their spiritual apathy. It was the reflection reflection of their spiritual poverty. It was the reflection of their spiritual backsliding that these people, they were no longer walking in that in, in the genuineness of their faith. There was something wrong in Jerusalem. The altar that needed to be rebuilt, it was reflected 
protecting their love, their joy, their peace, their integrity, their truth, their true worship, their true righteousness that comes by faith from God, their justice that needed to be rebuilt, that needed to be restored way in Jerusalem. That's why it was their first thing to be rebuilt. It was the altar. Let us look at the altar as the shadow of our Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. When Jesus appeared on the scene, the Bible tells us John the Baptist was the first man to identify him. He said, behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. He was referring to Jesus Christ, that he is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of God. The world and the Bible tells us even the following day after baptizing Jesus, he was standing with his two disciples and he saw Jesus coming and he pointed and said, Behold, the Lamb of God, Andrew and the other disciple, they followed Christ. In other words, John the Baptist was saying, Here is the Lamb of God that will be slain for the redemption of the nations. The Bible tells Tells us he was tempted in every area, yet found without sin. The Bible tells us when they had put Jesus in those kangaroo courts, in those kangaroo courts, they placed Jesus there. They brought people to, to, to maliciously defame his character and they bought people to lie about Jesus. Don't you think it's a new thing, child of God, to have manufacturers of lies? Don't you think it's a new thing, child of God, to have people that will just come to you with new I mean, I mean with, 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 with a propaganda and maliciousness to tarnish your integrity, to tarnish and defame your character. I am here to tell you, child of the living God, even Jesus was betrayed, even Jesus, there were witnesses, so-called witnesses that lied about Jesus. They lied about Jesus. They said Jesus Christ, he is a heretic teacher. They said Jesus Christ, he is the prince of the demons. They said Jesus Christ, he claims to be the king of the Jews. And they spoke all manner of lies. They said Jesus Christ, he said he can destroy the temple that was built and rebuilt it in three days. And Jesus was not referring to the physical temple that was built by man's hands. He was referring to his body that this body, it will be killed, it will be executed to death on the cross, but through the spirit and the power of resurrection, he will come back to life. And there were those false witnesses in those kangaroo courts, but even though they tried whatever that they tried, but Pilate, the governor, concluded and said, I find no fault in this man, this man doesn't deserve to be executed like a murderer, like a rapist. I find no charge in this man. But they said, crucify him. Pilate he even said, here is Barabbas. Should I give you Barabbas or Jesus? They said, no, 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 no. Don't free the Barabbas. Free the murderer. Free the rapist. Free the thief, free, free this notorious person, crucify Jesus. In other words, the four lambs will be executed on the brazen altar. It was the role of the priest to ensure that they were healthy, to ensure that they had no blemish, no mark, they were not, uh, they, they were not sick, they were ready to be sacrificed on the altar. And Jesus, when Pilate said, I 
find no fault in this man. In other words, indeed, Jesus, he was that sinless lamb. That's why when Peter speaks in 1 Peter chapter 1, he says we have been redeemed, not by silver, nor by gold, but by the precious blood of Jesus Christ, the lamb of God, with the outer blemish, the sinless lamb of God. Hallelujah. The Bible tells us that Jesus, he carried the cross, but for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despised the shame because of you and I. He endured the cross because of our redemption. He endured the cross because of our redemption as the nations. He endured the cross. Hallelujah. Jesus was executed on the cross. You look at the cross, it did the brazen altar. It was pointing. It was the shadow of the cross where Christ will be executed to death, not crucified, executed to death on the cross was as the lamb that, that had no blemish as the sinless lamb of God. Jesus was executed to death for our redemption. Jesus cried and said it is finished. In other words, the price has been paid in full for their sins. I've shed my blood. Hallelujah. For their redemption. God loves us and God loves you. You must understand that the brazen altar it reminds us about the, ult the, the, the ultimate hallelujah sacrifice the ultimate sacrifice that Christ did on the cross when he died and rose again the third day now if you look at that you and I today we are saved not by the blood of rams and of goats and bulls but by the precious blood of Jesus Christ the Lamb of God without blemish. Now, I want you to understand something, child of God, that a priest would then take the blood of the animal whose flesh has been bent on or burned rather on the altar. Then that priest, one I mean, I mean, I mean, priest who was called the high priest would then take that blood and go and sprinkle it before the mercy seat, sprinkle it on the altar in the holy of holies on behalf of the nation. That's what Jesus did, according to the author in the book of Hebrews. He entered the heavenly sanctuary by his own blood, not by not carrying the blood of the animal, not carrying the blood of of a bull, but he carried his own blood and sprinkled it on the altar in the heavenly sanctuary. Hallelujah. Before the Lord, our God, the life of the creature is in the blood. Christ was sprinkling his life. He had poured, sacrificed his life for the redemption of the nations. Why? Because sin had separated us from our heavenly Father, the ear of the Lord. It is not deaf to him nor his hand shot to save but our sins they have separated us from our God they create a wall between us and our heavenly father the Bible tells us the wages of sin is death whosoever commits sin is a slave of sin we did not have the power we did not have the strength to please our Heavenly Father. But what did God do? What did our Heavenly Father do? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but receive everlasting life. We have been saved not by works but by grace. Lest any man should boast. We have been saved by grace through faith. 
belief in Jesus Christ, our sins are forgiven by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. We are freed and delivered from the power and the influence of sin by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. We are joined as with Jesus. We are the righteousness of God. We are God's field, God's building, co-workers with Christ, the able eye of our heavenly Father. Why? It is by grace through faith in Jesus, the Lamb of God that was slain for our redemption at the altar of the cross. That's where he was bruised. That's where he was pierced. That's where he breathed his last. Hallelujah. For you and I, so that we can today praise him, worship him, glorify him, not by our own works of righteousness, so that we can praise him and worship him, not by our own wisdom, but it is by grace, through faith in Jesus, that we have the righteousness, we are the righteousness of God, the righteousness that comes by faith from God, through Jesus. Well, the Bible tells us our own righteousness, they are like filthy rags in the eyes of our Heavenly Father. Now, I spoke about the brazen altar as the shadow of Christ, the Lamb of God, that was slain on the cross for our sins. Now, let us as well look at this altar before I close again, that the altar, it was a place of sacrifice. The altar, it was a place of of slaughter, of death, hallelujah. Something died there on behalf of the nation. Hence, Jesus died on behalf of the nations. Now we have been called by God, hallelujah, to die, to die with Christ where on the cross to die with him we are also the Lord calls us to death as well the Lord calls us to sacrifice what do you mean pastor God calls us to death the death of the world death from the world before death from the world death from self the old man death from the systems and the patterns of the world that are evil. What do you mean now? In the book of Romans, chapter 12, verse 1 and 2 and 3, the Bible tells us, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the message of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice and holy and acceptable unto the Lord, which is your reasonable service. Do not conform unto the standards of this world, to cosmos, hallelujah, to the systems and the patterns of this world that are evil and governed by the prince of the power of the air. Don't take the shape, don't take the form, hallelujah, of this world, but be ye transformed by the renewal of the mind. Now we have been called now to do it, to present our bodies, to consecrate our bodies, to sacrifice our lives. I cannot build his purpose. I cannot build his vision. I cannot pursue his destiny. I cannot be sold out for his, I mean, for his vision. If I myself Self, I have not placed my life at the altar. Hallelujah. I have not sacrificed my will. Hallelujah. My will, my plans, my life at the altar of the Lord. The Lord is saying through Paul, I am calling you. Don't present your bodies to the altar of the world. Don't present your bodies to the altar of the pleasures of sin. I'm calling you that you present your bodies unto the Lord as a sacrifice. So in other words, these sacrifices we are, we don't die physically, literally. But what do we do? Paul is saying in the book of Galatians chapter 2 verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who lives, but Christ lives in me and the life that I live in this sinful flesh. I live it by faith in the Son of God who died for me. 
hallelujah, who died for me, who gave his life as a ransom. So in other words, Paul is saying, where Christ died, that's where my selfishness was, was named. Where Christ died on the cross, that's where my sinful nature, that's where selfishness, that's where fornication, that's where jealousy, that's where unforgiveness was nailed on the cross. Now Paul is saying, and it's no longer I who lives, but Christ lives in me. My life is a life of sacrifice. Hallelujah. Unto the Lord God Almighty. It is Christ living in me. The hope of glory. I have died from the old man. I have died to self. I have died from the world, but alive in the kingdom of God. What does Paul say now when he says, when he says I've been crucified with Christ? It's no longer I who lives, but Christ lives in me. In the life I live in this body, I live it by faith. Hallelujah. It's no longer about self-effort, self-reformation. It's no longer about self strength I am relying, I am depending to the son of God to please him, to serve him to walk with him to love him, because at some point I wanted to do righteousness but I will end up doing what is unrighteous because of the power and the dynamite of sin that is within me until the hope of glory, until Jesus Christ, he that the son sets free is a free indeed until he arrived then I started to know that I don't only accept him but I rely and depend on Jesus to live a victorious life over the power of the flesh on the daily basis the Bible tells us Paul is calling the Roman believers he says offer the members of your body as the instruments of righteousness not as the instruments of unrighteousness. Hallelujah. Offer the members of your body. Why you must offer the members of your body? Paul reminds them in Romans chapter 6, the first verses, that if we died with him, Hallelujah. When Christ died, we died with him. When he was buried, we were buried with him. When Christ was rose, I mean, when, 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 when he rose up from the dead, we were also raised up with him. He died, we died with him. He was buried, we were buried with him. When he rose from the dead, we were raised up with him. Him. So in other words, my sinful, my, my old man, my sinful nature, what, did it, what, what happened there? It was defeated on the cross. I'm going to explain to you what I mean by saying that. It was defeated, it was nailed on the cross. And when Christ died, I died from the systems and the patterns of this world. I died from being governed and controlled by sin, by, 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 the, by the desires of the flesh. Does it mean sinful nature does not exist? It is still there. It exists. It gives you signals. It speaks with you. It tells you to do something that is contrary to the word of God. Because whenever you are tempted, you are tempted by your own evil desire that has come James is saying whenever we are tempted it is an evil desire hallelujah that has drawn us away from our heavenly father it started with a thought that was conceived and it gave birth to sin that evil desire but the bible tells us he will never allow us to be tempted more than we can bear he will give us a door of of escape out of that temptation, out of the fire of that temptation. Hallelujah. So what am I trying to say here? Paul is saying if we died with him, you must know that you also died and buried the old man. Hallelujah. The old life of lying. The old life of jealousy. The old man of selfishness. The old man of slander and gossip, the older man of 
gratifying and fulfilling the desires of the flesh. If we, if he was buried, we were also buried with him. It means when Jesus rose from the dead, we were raised with him. When we were raised with him, we were raised in the newness of life. It means we put on the new man. We put on Christ. We put on the new man who is characterized by love, by kindness, hallelujah, integrity and truth, righteousness and holiness. We put on the new man. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And this is exactly what was taking place here in the book of Ezra chapter 3. What they were simply doing, they were dedicating their lives. They were consecrating their lives at the altar. That's why I'm, I'm, I'm saying the altar for altar. What am I trying to say when you say the altar for altar? Hallelujah. The altar for altar. Now altar, it's A L T A R. Altar. If you want, that, that's the altar. Now when you pronounce it, when you pronounce these two words, they seem as if they, they speak the same thing. Because the second altar, it is the A L T E R. Not A R E R. The altar for alteration. The altar for transformation. The altar for change. The altar, hallelujah, for restoration. The altar for one to be molded and his lifestyle to conform to the conduct of Christ. Altar, hallelujah. The altar for altar. But it, there's no difference in pronunciation of these two words. But I want you to gather something here. Altar, the altar, the place of sacrifice for altar. Now, which means to change the appearance, the character or structure of something. That's the meaning of alteration. That's the meaning of alteration. That's where we get the word alteration from altar. A-L-T-E-R. An altar for alteration, for change of character. Hallelujah. Because remember these people, they had spent some decades in Babylon and in Persia. And the first thing that they had to do, it was to rebuild and the altar that was torn down, that was broken down. Hallelujah. If you go to the book of, I mean, First Kings chapter 18, verse 30, the Bible will tell us that Elijah, when he reappeared again and he was seen by Obadiah to release a word to Ahab, after three years, the Bible declares he called God's people on Mount Carmel. When he called God's people on Mount Carmel, he said to them, how long are you going to waver between two opinions? And he called upon the 450 false prophets of Baal. Baal was a god that was worshipped, that was introduced by Jezebel in Israel. And the Bible declares, Elijah said, if Baal is God, you bring here two bulls and you take the other bull, you prepare it, you slaughter it, and you place that bull on, on, on top of wood and you are not going to put fire underneath the wood, then we are all going to pray. If Baal, Baal is God, then he's going to answer by fire and consume the sacrifice. But if God is the true living God, he will come and consume my sacrifice with fire. And the challenge was taken by the 450 prophets of Baal and they built the altar. Can you see that? They built the altar before they sacrificed to their God, false God. But they knew that the altar, it is a place where it makes us one with our God. They knew that the altar, it is a place where humanity meets divinity. When you say divinity, it doesn't mean that it meets God himself. It can also meet unclean spirits as well as according to the false prophets of Baal who built an altar 
and the Bible declares they prepared their bull, they placed their bull there, they started to pray to them, to, 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 to bail from morning, they prayed, it was the afternoon, and was it was evening, Elijah started to mock them and said, I think maybe Baal is on a vacation or maybe he is sleeping or maybe he's meditating. Why don't you holler aloud? Why don't you cry and raise up and lift up your voices? And the Bible declares they started to cut their flesh with sharp knives. They started to cut their flesh and the Bible declares they started to bleed as they were crying out to bail. That's what religion does. It sucks blood out of you. It sucks life out of you. Hallelujah. And they started to cry and cry and call upon bail. And it was in the evening now. The Bible tells us, I was asking myself, why did Elijah wait for the whole day, giving them the whole, all the time they needed up until it was evening. That's what the Bible declares. Until it was evening. To, to show them that our true God, he does not sleep nor slumber. When we sleep in the evening, the Lord is working. When we are awake during the day, the Lord is at work. He does not sleep nor slumber. Hallelujah. Why did Elijah wait until evening? He wanted them to have a clear sight that the sun is stronger than the moon. He wanted them to be clear, to have a clear sight. Wow, what an extraordinary sight of seeing fire in the midst of darkness. At night, fire coming down from heaven to consume the sacrifice. Remember, his sacrifice, it was also, it was not just a bull and wood and sea of seeds underneath. Listen, his fire, his sacrifice, they also saturated the bull and the altar in water. Hallelujah. He, he made the point that the altar was a mercy in a sense. It was saturated in water. How can you kindle a sacrifice that was saturated in water? How can you burn wood that is wet? How can you burn a flesh that is wet? But that's what Elijah did, and then he began to call upon the Lord God Almighty. Even his prayer, it was not about his ego. It was not about show off. It was not about him proving a point. It was about his God showing himself faithful to his word. It was about his God showing himself as to restore the hearts of the Israelites back to true worship. Before rain revival arrived, the Bible tells as Elijah in First Kings chapter 18 verse 30, he repaired the altar that was broken down after repairing the altar and then he prayed as I've explained to you, fire came from heaven and consumed the bull that was saturated in water and consumed the wood that was saturated in water to show what kind of fire that burns even wet wood, what kind of fire that even leaks the water because it's the water that that that, that must extinguish the fire, but this fire, it is inexhaustible. This fire, it is unquenchable. This fire, it is defiant. This fire, it even consumes water. Nothing stands in the way of this fire because this fire, it was not a man-made fire. It was God himself, the consuming fire, burning the sacrifice. But before fire came, before rain descended, before revival broke out, then he first repaired the altar. Before the children of Judah 
built or rebuilt the temple, they first repaired the altar for alteration. It was about their lives, saying, Lord, alter my heart, alter my mind, alter my lifestyle. Lord, we are here to rebuild that first love. We are here to rebuild, hallelujah, that prayer life. We are here to rebuild that passion for the way of God that has been lost. We are here to rebuild that intimate relationship with the Holy Spirit. Spirit. Oh Lord, we are here. Take us where we belong. Oh Lord, take us, oh Father, to that first love. Take us, oh Father, to that passion we used to have for the lost souls. They began by building an altar, a place of sacrifice for them to be sold out, a place of sacrifice for them to dedicate their lives. Hallelujah. Unto the Lord God Almighty before the construction begins and there will be no excuses and there will be no slander there will be no betrayal there will be no backbiting as they place their hands in rebuilding the temple because all those things have been banned to ashes on the altar the brazen altar the Bible tells us I beseech you brethren by the message of God I don't know what is torn down. Our prayer lives might have, we feel like, you know what, my personal altar is torn down. My family altar is torn down. My love is broken down for God. My hope in Him is broken down. My passion for God is broken down. Can we today rebuild the altar? Hallelujah. For our lives to be altered. To conform to the will, to the conduct, and the life of Christ. Before we rebuild, before we build, let us first dedicate our hearts. I will love you, Lord, with all my heart, with all my soul, and my strength. Hallelujah. It is all about you, O oh Father. Father, in the name of Jesus, I want to thank you. I bless you. I honor you. I glorify and exalt your name in Jesus' mighty name. Thank you, Father, for this word, for us to know that sometimes, Lord, we want to do something, but because of fear, it paralyzes us. It, it, it takes us, oh, Father, into holes of fear, holes of discouragement, holes, Father, of low self-esteem. But, Lord, help us to emulate this generation that even when fear had come upon them, they were able to rise up and rebuild, Lord, that altar unto the Lord God Almighty. Lord, they did not throw their tools. They did not neglect the purpose. They did not neglect your call. They did not neglect your destiny because of fear. But they were able to thrive in the midst of fear of the unknown. They were able to thrive in the midst of destructive storms. Help us, oh Father, to sow our lives, oh God, in the soil of your kingdom as living sacrifices, oh Father. Father, that Lord will be vessels of honor, vessels of, of, of gold, vessels, oh Father, that will carry the message of reconciliation unto the nations. In Jesus' mighty name, I pray. If you are here today with us, joining us online, you would like to accept Jesus Christ. I spoke about Christ, the Lamb of God that was slain on the cross for our redemption. Today you can believe with your heart Confess with your mouth and you shall be saved. Your sins will be forgiven. You shall become the child of God. You shall receive the precious gift of eternal life by grace alone, through faith in Jesus Christ. If that's what you are saying as a child, you are saying, Lord, I want to be your child. I want to be filled by your love. I want to be this living sacrifice that is holy unto thee. You don't become holy by your own works. Holiness, righteousness is imputed in us through faith in Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And God gives us grace to maintain that righteousness, to continue to pursue that holiness. If that's what you are saying, can you pray after me? Say, Lord Jesus, I accept you as my Lord and Savior. Thank you for the precious gift of eternal life. 